in Washington, D.C. for the World Bank Group and IMF Spring Meetings 2023. I'm Noriana Fernando, your host for today's event, Building Resilience and Reshaping Development, a conversation between World Bank Group President David Malpass and IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva. It has been three years since the start of the pandemic, and the uncertainties and risks still weigh on the global economy. The poor and the vulnerable are the most affected by inflation, the cost of living crisis and slower growth. And the effects of climate change and the war in Ukraine continue to disrupt lives and livelihoods around the world. Now, these spring meetings are focused on these global challenges and how we can respond to them to promote growth, equity and prosperity for all. President Malpass and Managing Director Georgieva will discuss these issues during the next half an hour. Now remember, you can share your thoughts on these topics at any time using the hashtag reshaping development. We're live on Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn with simultaneous interpretation in Arabic, French and Spanish. Now to kick off this week's public programming, I will hand it over to President Malpass and MD Georgieva. 
Thank you very much. Good, good, uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. We are starting off the uh, week of uh, meetings uh, of the World Bank IMF meetings, the IMF World Bank uh, spring meetings, uh, with, a, with a big agenda. We want to talk about the world economy, about the debt problems facing developing countries. Uh, but the, the, the overall theme is how do we get better outcomes for people uh, around the world, and especially for people that are on the lower end of the income scale, people in developing countries and, and people in middle-income countries and advanced economies that are suffering from, uh, from lower incomes and uh, from the costs of climate change, for, for, as, as a, for instance. And so that's the thrust of the spring meetings. And I wonder, Kristalina, uh, you, IMF does a lot of look at the global economic out, out, outlook. We are worried about the slow slowness of growth now and the prospect that it might stay slow. What do you think and what are the big challenges? Well, David, uh, let me first thank you for honoring this tradition for us to start the meetings week together. Uh, you're right, uh, we are yet again assembling our membership at the time of uh, high uncertainty. The recovery we so much are hoping for a robust recovery is still a bit elusive. Why? Because we do have a significant inflation problem. That means central banks have to continue to keep interest rates higher to combat it. And that is on the way of restoring the prospects uh, for robust uh, growth. We have seen that this rapid transition from low interest rates, abundant liquidity to high interest rates and much less available liquidity has exposed vulnerabilities in the financial sector. That made the task of policymakers even harder. So in that context, what we are projecting for this year is despite the remarkable resilience of consumer spending in the United States, in Europe, despite the uplift from China's reopening, global growth would remain below 3% as we projected it earlier this year. And what is more concerning, it would remain around 3% for the next five years. That does not give us high hope for meeting the aspirations of people, especially poor people around the world, and most importantly, poor people in poor countries. Uh, let me stress three issues in that context. The first one is that this picture of growth is divergent. There are emerging markets that are doing better. But for frontier markets, for the poor countries, the future is not so bright. And in terms of income per capita growth, poor countries would remain below income per capita growth in middle income countries. Dangerous divergence. Two, we have been wrestling with one crisis after another, one shock after another. And that has pushed on the back burden the longer term agenda of structural reforms that are paramount to uplift productivity. And with productivity remaining low, the prospects for growth are low. And three, the ropes that tie us together have become weaker over the last years. Fragmentation is deepening, and what it means is that what has generated tremendous impetus for growth and prosperity over the last three decades, an, e an integrated economy is being negatively impacted. We have done research at the IMF that shows that just the costs of trade fragmentation can run as high as 7% of global GDP over the years. 
So these meetings are a, an opportunity for us not only to talk about the immediate priorities of restoring price stability and safeguarding financial stability, but also about the longer term prospects of growth and how prosperity can be an achievable objective for the lower income countries. Which takes me to you. How do you see uh, that? Uh, the, the, the Exactly right. And uh, as, as we look at it, the, the uh, elements of growth into the future, uh, it's important that there be more investment, uh, investment in small businesses, in, uh, uh, in new businesses. Uh, and that means a flow of capital. And a worry that we have for developing countries is the capital inflow, the capital flow right now is out of developing countries. So there's, for many of the developing countries, it looks like they're in a phase of decapitalization rather than recapitalization. That goes with your point that the, instead of having convergence, meaning peop the, the, uh, uh, people with lower incomes growing faster than people with with higher incomes. So convergence toward a higher level, mm -hmm. that's not happening right now. It's actually a divergence and that's uh, that's gravely concerning. That means inequality, that means fragility uh, for countries. And we see more countries falling into uh, fragility. One of the concerns with the current with high prices now, high prices are being applied to food and fertilizer, and a concern for the poorest around the world is the farmers are not able to plant, or the, the, and if they don't get fertilizer often, they won't plant for the crop cycle uh, because they know that their yields will be too low. Uh, and so a, an urgent need, and we've worked on this over the last six months, but it uh, still has room to come together, uh, is that the fertilizer resources go to the people that can pay the most, mm -hmm. uh, and that means those farmers are providing the global uh, crop supplies. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's that's a challenge. Right now, for example, wheat supplies globally are at a low level. China has substantial stockpiles, but most of the other c countries have drawn down uh, their stockpiles, and so that points to a period of uh, strain on global food supplies. I wanted to pick up on your point about uh, to the trade uh, fragmentation. So as we think about that, trade is uh, vital to productivity within the world. People uh, swapping goods in their in their village, in within their country, and across borders is a way to add value, to create more productivity. Uh, and to the extent that that breaks down into uh, regional blocks or protectionist blocks, uh, that's that's a concern and right now that's the direction of travel for the world to to uh, as it as it looks to stop the globalization and to reverse it the risk is that it will come out with uh, with unproductive structures mm -hmm. uh, and that also will weigh on world growth and I guess I'll, I'll finish on your opening point that ju just the move from very low interest rates, I think artificially low interest rates and the capital allocation that went with it, meaning b investors all over the world were making decisions based on the idea that it was 0% interest rates mm -hmm. for a long yep. period of time, low for long, uh, and that misallocated the capital. So to bring that back to productive uses uh, is really hard. If you, if you say, well, we're going to keep the interest rate at current levels or go to a more normal levels of mm -hmm. interest rates, that means losses yep. for banks that had a duration mismatch, mm -hmm. as we saw with Silicon Valley Bank. And so there, there's losses being allocated by the world system now, mm -hmm. but we should keep in mind, if you just lower the interest rates back down, it won't solve the problem. What that means is that people will suffer from inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, the dollar weakens, yes. yep. the inflation rate goes back up, and that hurts the poor yep. the most. So I think there has to be a goal of finding a yes. low inflation yes. environment Environment yep. and dollar stability for the future. Very much agree with that. Um, central banks uh, do have a preoccupation to bring inflation down. And it is paramount because without price stability, there is no sound foundation for investments and for growth. Their job has become more complicated because of the exposure of vulnerabilities in the financial sector 
that means attention has to be paid to financial stability. Fortunately, they have different tools they can apply to deal with these two different problems. They can fight inflation <coughs> by keeping interest rates higher for longer, and they can provide targeted liquidity should there be a need to bring down risks to financial stability. What we have seen is a remarkable, rapid and effective intervention by policymakers, primarily central banks, but not only financial authorities, supervisory authorities, regulatory authorities. Once there was a problem exposed, they acted swiftly. <coughs> and this is very different to what happened during the global financial crisis. So there is something to celebrate. We learned a lesson, we act on it. However, when we looked into the, look into the future, the problem that you outlined, allocation of capital, it has to be recognized that without the confidence that productivity is going to go up, how does it go up? It goes up when there is effective investment in education, skills development, adaptability to changing labor market needs. It gets up when there is effective investment in research and innovation, and it goes into private sector performance. It doesn't stay locked into monopolies that only have access to these uh, uh, new uh, discoveries. And productivity goes up when division of labor that trade provides is effectively energized. I do hope that as we have these meetings to talk about the immediate pressing priorities of price stability, financial stability, we will pay more attention to how the world can go into a higher growth path. <coughs> I apologize. This is vital to the world. Uh, the, the, the getting the growth rate higher is important for people's jobs. It's important also for the migration patterns of countries. You know, if, if we're in a world where people have to migrate to other countries in order to have uh, access to capital, uh, that that uh, is a challenge. And they're being pushed by climate change. They're being pushed by their own countries having domestic debt problems. Uh, and so that pressure is substantial. So I think there's an urgency to the, the, uh, the, the the policy changes. Now, I, I want to uh, inquire on, on one specific area. Uh, as the central banks raise uh, raise interest rates. They've described it as a, a goal of, uh, of uh, reducing demand within the economy. Mm -hmm. I think there really has to be much more awareness that the, the long-term solution is through much greater supply, yes. and that means yep. short-term financing for small businesses, for yes. medium-sized businesses. Right now, or w w somehow we fell into a cycle, I think, mm -hmm. uh, over the last 10 years where the central banks were buying long maturity assets and that really fundamentally changed the direction of the world toward bigness uh, that uh, governments can issue 10-year bonds small businesses don't issue 10-year bonds and so one of the things I hope we could do uh, is uh, really have a clear view how do you get back to a world where short-term financing is available to businesses I very we're not much, there I very very much agree with this, uh, David. Uh, it matters to uh, everyone. It matters a lot to emerging markets and developing economies. We know that in emerging markets and developing economies, if the small and medium-sized enterprises are suffocated, there is simply no way to generate the jobs a growing population demands from this in these countries. Uh, so that question of how we think about financing, accessibility to finance for everyone, especially for women-led business, is something that the World Bank has researched for quite some time. 
this is, this is a, again, on the list of issues that got pushed down because of this shock upon shock upon shock. Uh, and I want to say, we cannot finish this conversation without recognizing that one of these shocks, the senseless war in Ukraine, can go away by just a decision taken by the country that invaded Ukraine to stop the war. Why that matters? Why that matters what, what we are discussing here? Because one, this war has distracted the world's attention from many other pressing uh, problems. This war not only kills people, it is pushing up food prices, you talked about it, and it is creating more geopolitical tensions, pushing down the ability of the world to work as one. So I want to recognize there is a problem there that these meetings cannot resolve, but it would help tremendously with the agenda we are discussing if it gets resolved. It, it, it would, and the horror of the, the war is ever present. And uh, uh, as you know, it's, uh, the world's gone from the COVID uh, pandemic to now this uh, also horrible um, uh, uh, development and outcome and uh, lasting longer and longer uh, than than people had hoped. We've been involved, as you know, in in uh, helping channel world uh, resources to the to the civilian sector of Ukraine uh, as a as a uh, maintenance operation, and we're also looking at the recovery uh, side of the Ukrainian economy. And you, you, we're we're talking in shorthand to an extent because we see each other regularly. And often talk about uh, structural reforms and the upside opportunity mm -hmm. that countries have if they can find stronger fiscal policy, stronger uh, uh, domest uh, what domestic domestic call... resource mobilization. <laughs> that, yes, that means yeah. taxes. But we look at systems to have a, a broader base for the taxes rather than higher rates. Ways that allow the country, the people of the country, to have more economic activity. Uh, and so that's the daily chores of World Bank and IMF of uh, wh how do we interact with Ethiopia, with Egypt, with Nigeria, with South Africa, countries that are looking for a direction with Turkey, with, uh, and, and on, I, I didn't mean to mention just a few, with a hundred countries around the world, how do we work uh, together really to find yep. a path for the country that has better growth on the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, the challenge is the burdens keep adding up. The burden of debt, the burden of climate costs, the burden of, uh, of uh, the higher food prices, all of those add up substantially. So mm -hmm. we're at a bit of a liquidity uh, crunch for the poorer countries and also this longer term problem of where do you get growth? I mean, we know where it comes from, productivity from new investment, mm -hmm. but the stars aren't aligned right now to achieve that. Well, this is why it is good that uh, twice a year <laughs> we can all get together and then concentrate on what we can do by better coordination of our members and, of course, of our institutions. Uh, I want to bring a, an element of positivism in this discussion. Yes, it is a very difficult time, but if we look back in what we have achieved over the last three years, three and a half years. Uh, it is a lot, uh, uh, David. One, we have managed to come together very early when the COVID hit. And collectively, the members themselves taking the appropriate policy actions and our institutions financing those that had no access to other sources of financing. That managed to bring the impact of COVID economically much further down than it would have been otherwise. I remember our first assessment of the risks of the COVID crisis was 10% contraction of the world economy. Didn't happen. 3.1 is not nothing, but it is far from 10% contraction. I remember you and I discussing how we can coordinate actions on financial terms, 
how we got together. Uh, our very first uh, loan uh, was uh, to Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyz Republic, one week hour after WHO announced the COVID pandemic. Since then, we have financed 96 countries. Never in the history of the IMF we have done so much for so many, and we have done that together uh, with you. We have recognized that as a problem. Uh, I want to give you the credit for being such a strong voice, including your latest blog, on behalf of countries that find themselves crushed by the burden of debt. We have called for the debt service suspension initiative, and now we are in these meetings, David, and I am so very pleased we can tell our audience we are not letting our guard down on this issue. We are going to have the Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable, bringing for the first time all creditors, traditional, new, public, private, with the debt the countries and, and with us, the key institutions, so we can sit around the table and find solutions to what otherwise can be devastating for countries. So we have done things together that would have been much less effective if we didn't have that platform. To everybody coming to the meetings, roll your sleeves, let's continue in that spirit of getting things done. And since uh, this is the uh, last time I have this pleasure of sitting with you at the start of the meetings, uh, David, what is your hope for the future? What do you see on the horizon uh, for our institutions? What is the wisdom you would like to pass to all who are watching and, of course, uh, to, 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 to the grateful me? <laughs> That's, that's awfully nice. Uh, and I, I pick up the word wisdom, I'll, so I'm, I don't know if I can ach achieve that, but I'm going to share a little bit. Um, I'm going to go from the small to the large. Mm -hmm. um, w w four years ago yesterday, I walked into the atrium here as president of the World Bank, uh, and you were a mainstay of uh, global development, mm -hmm. uh, at, for, then at the World Bank, now at the uh, IMF. And one of our... Uh, uh, one of our challenges was to try to find breakthroughs in countries. Uh, that was my hope. You know, I, we uh, always had the vision of how do we get better outcomes for people in developing countries, but then we recognized that a way to do that was to have individual breakthroughs or regional breakthroughs, some new insight, whether it be in the area of currencies or of uh, fiscal policy or of trade policy or of uh, 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 infrastructure development. So I'm still working to get breakthroughs. One of the ones we worked on early was Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. We saw that the, uh, the the dual exchange rate, they, they, they have an official exchange rate which is available to the few and a parallel market exchange rate that is very expensive for the rest uh, within the country. And it has not worked very well. I. Took, I went to Ethiopia in early on, in May of 2019. Mm -hmm. You went, I think, mm -hmm. in August of 2019. And we will again be tackling that in the debt roundtable or, and in our meetings this week to see if there can be a breakthrough because uh, the number of people's lives that are at stake mm -hmm. is huge. I don't know, I, I didn't look up, but Ethiopia may have 120 million people. It's a large number uh, and growing. Uh, and so, uh, creating a better future for them uh, is both a macro challenge and then a micro challenge, letting more imports and exports flow in and out uh, through better systems is going to be vital for their growth and getting their living standards higher. So I wanted to start on, you know, the, uh, a lot of what we've done over these, f my, my four, ye four years, uh, it has been uh, on specific countries and regions. How do you pro solve problems? problems uh, in various parts of the world, uh, but then that, that has confronted this giant macro overlay of the world of uh, COVID, slow growth, rising interest rates, and uh, the, the, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, all, of, all of that conspiring, in a way, uh, 
uh, to give not enough money for any of the goals that, uh, uh, that we have for people in developing countries. So I feel good about, uh, you, you know, it was a, it's been a very busy four years. And prior to that, uh, at the U.S. Treasury, uh, working on similar issues uh, at a very rapid pace. So I feel good about that, very good about the World Bank uh, uh, group, the, 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 all, of our, all of our entities, uh, but also um, uh, worried, I guess I'll say, frankly, about prospects for people in developing countries. There's, there's not a good avenue. I like your point of optimism. We have technology. We have institutions that care. Uh, we have uh, 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 an, enough, there's enough money in the world. There's enough capital in the world mm -hmm. to make it work. But my concern is it's all absorbed into a small group and it's uh, not working right now. And it takes some fundamental changes in order to make it work. Uh, it's been I, a pleasure yeah. working with you through these four years. I am uh, I'm very confident that um, uh, solutions will be found. It is a matter of uh, uh, will and then you find a way. Uh, I always um, remember in the context of these conversations when we have a very steep mountain to climb uh, what Nelson Mandela once said, impossible until it is done. And I really uh, look forward to engaging with our membership uh, during this uh, week, uh, David, engaging with you, with our partners at, uh, at the World <laughs> Bank. Because if we can imagine a world in which the tremendous capital, the wealth that is created is put for the bigger public good, in which we open up opportunities for everyone to reach their full potential, in which we deal with the tremendous challenge of climate change, then we can say Mandela, Mandela is right. All of these things that we discussed that are so difficult, impossible until they are done. Uh, the great theme for our challenging week ahead. We, 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 we each have 15 hard meetings. I don't know, you may have 25 hard meetings uh, ahead this week, uh, but with a clear uh, goal. Uh, and so uh, tr enjoy where you can. I'll try to do the same. And uh, uh, we're, we're launching our, our week of spring meetings. Yes. Great. And I can see that uh, our... Uh, <laughs> gracious host is looking at us with this yes, sign I'm that says <laughs> your time is up thank you for that fantastic <laughs> conversation thank you president malpass md Georgieva. you have indeed provided us with some insightful context on the major issues that will be on your plate this week and with that we come to the end of this event but there is more to come you can watch this replay as well as other events throughout the week on live.worldbank.org forward slash spring meetings 2023 we hope you've enjoyed hearing from our distinguished guests today but please continue your comments online with the hashtag reshaping development we would love to hear from you I'm Noriana Fernando and thank you for joining us